May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the direction and wisdom of the Holy Spirit be with us this morning as we have a meeting, as we ponder, as we are led by the Spirit. The 4th of July weekend gives us an opportunity to take a look at religious freedom. It also gives us an opportunity to thank God for the country that we have, for the freedoms that are given with our country. For many of us, it was our great-great-grandparents. For some of us, like me, that's true. Also grandparents, great-grandparents. And for some of us, it came more recently to this country that has an openness to people, no matter what religion, no matter where they're from. There are difficulties as far as that whole system and how it works, but yet the country of the United States calls for people to come. And in this country, we were... It led to some good thinking, though. Some good thinking because... What allowed these colonists to do this? And in doing this, they called upon the insight and the power and the direction of God. And in doing that, they also said that we will be a, a government that respects and understands the, 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 what the Creator and what the Creator has done for us. So, who's in charge? Is it... Is it the government, or is it uh, uh, God himself? And the founders, as, they, as we have read, the founders said it is both. When we look at what then was developed as far as a little bit later, as far as a number of years after this, the, the Constitution was brought into effect. And, and so the, the issue of freedom of religion was guaranteed in the First Amendment, and we have that. Congress shall make no law expecting an establishment of religion, or affecting establishment, not allowing it, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Oh. Have you, just on key, right on cue for me, this last week, perhaps you have read about Trinity Lutheran Church in Columbia, Missouri, had their appeal to the Supreme Court upheld. They were, they were allowed, as a religious organization, they are, are allowed to get uh, subsidized grants from the state of Missouri that was for everybody that was going to build a playground. And the playground was open for the church, the school, but also for the neighborhood. But they were rejected by the state. Freedom of religion, freedom of religion. What does it allow you to do? Where is the wall? They were rejected by the state saying that because they were a religious organization, they were not entitled to this free money. It went all the way to the Supreme Court and through the power of our government and the wise, wise thinking of the creators of this country, having, an, uh, having in our system of government an ability to go to the Supreme Court and make those decisions based upon the Constitution. So where do we go with this? Freedom of religion. Who's in charge? Where do we go? Jesus answered this in such a clever way. The whole story goes like this. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. We've already explained who they were. Saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and you do not care about anyone's opinions, for you are not swayed by appearances. So they were building him up, complimenting him, setting him up so that he would fail. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. By the way, they paid all kinds of all kinds of taxes. They paid taxes on on their products. Ten percent of the wheat had to go to the government. Twenty percent of their oil and, and um, their oil and what else was it that had to go to to them? The, the oil from the olives, 
and also other pr produce that they had. They, they had to also pay a census tax. They had to pay a commercial tax whenever you moved. So they had a lot of taxes. And now Jesus is, is approached with this question. Is it lawful? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And that's about one day's uh, uh, value as far as one day's of work value. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him, and went away. And went away. 20% of the wine, as well as 20% of the oil, they had to give to him. So you see, the taxes was a, was a real issue. Especially it was an issue because they did not respect the Romans as their true, as their true government. They were in turmoil. There were zealots at that time who wanted, to, who wanted to overthrow the Romans. But here Jesus said, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And so splitting the two kingdoms apart. When Luther came about as far as his life was concerned. He delivered grace and the true secret of the gospel. And in doing so, putting up the 95 theses and getting involved as far as the diet of worms, which is always kind of an unusual vision in your mind. But the worms was a city. And at the diet of the worms, he was asked to retrace and take away and one of the final statements that he said, I cannot say that what I have said and the books that I have written are wrong unless I am proven, unless I am proven by Scripture itself. Not by the Pope, not by the Church, but by the Scripture alone. And so now we have him looking at and dividing who he is to follow, not the government, who was controlled very much by the Pope, but through the scriptures and so then explained further as things came about because now their country was without the same theocracy if you want to put it that way that they had, been, they, they had had and so now he explained to them that there was a right hand kingdom and a left hand kingdom and the right hand kingdom was where we received the truth but the left hand kingdom the government has power as long as the power is used in a scriptural, godly way. And that's the issue. And that's where we get into religious freedom and the situation we have now. So when we look at Luther, theocracy, theocracy is when your government is ruled totally by your religion. You've heard of Shura, Shura law, Sharia law, and that is one of the issues as far as the Muslim people is concerned. The best way that we can deal with the Muslim people is to love them and to care for them and to reach out to them. Not the zealots, but the people. But at the same time, we have to realize that Sharia law is their part of their culture. And so there is, in different countries this has been worked out, but there is that issue as far as who is in charge. Which government? Is it Sharia law? Or is it government of the United States? Freedom of religion. And so we start looking. How do we handle that? Recently we know that because in back in the 1960s, things changed as far as schools were concerned. Religion freedom changed as far as public schools were concerned. In 1962 and 1963, there were some uh, incredibly important cases decided in the Supreme Court that said prayer is no longer allowed in the school. Prayer is no longer allowed in school. So then what happens? The one judge, one Supreme Court judge that said, I don't agree with the majority who said this, said what you have done now is instead of protecting religion, you have taken religion out. The wall that separates religion and government is now 
is now no longer separated, but you have taken government and gone over to the side of religion. His point was, and this is, is obviously an interesting point, one of discussion, but his point was that now because prayer has been taken out, our, our schools have become secularized, have become atheist, and so there is no, or could be. That's why we need good, wonderful Christian people in our, in our schools, in our public schools. But it also is a thought as far as the great uh, opportunities that homeschools give and also the great opportunities that parochial schools give, where Jesus, where Christ is worshipped, where Christ is talked about. And so we don't have that distinction or have to worry about as long as they don't move in. The, how does the government move in? Let me give you just one point. There is a judge in Wyoming, a municipal court judge, uh, by the name of Neely, that refused to marry same-sex individuals, even though it was a law of the land. So the movement was said, we need to remove her, take her away, but th their Supreme Court said no. She either has to not have any marriages, not marry anybody, or she has to follow the law. And so she remained. So it was another one that was one. Now, I thank you for following me with this because I feel that you have, but you're saying, what is this, how does this do? What is this about or how does this affect me? Certainly, you, I believe, I understand that we need to fight for a religious freedom, that we need to not ever be overwhelmed. We need to do what it says in the scripture in Acts. First of all, Peter writes this, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. But earlier in the Bible, at least in Acts, Peter says this, we ought to obey God rather than man. One of the earliest memories that I have of my parents ever getting involved, at least talking over politics with, with the family, and I was very young, uh, seven or eight, I remember them talking about something about voting and what was happening. And, uh, and I, I asked, well, what is this about? And my folks did not talk very much about politics. But they said, well, this is about something that's being proposed that would not allow parents to educate their children as they wanted them to. So it was against, as I understand it, probably against parochial education. It was voted down. But I remember them being very sensitive about that and saying that is the one thing, the one thing. So what that, that, is, that we can no, not tolerate and we will fight against the government if that would ever become a law. So what do we have in the United States? We have a country that is based upon freedom. We have a country that has a system of laws. We have a country, however, that is changing very much. And a huge part of that is the fact that there, are, that there is less and less of a solid base in any institution, a solid base of what is right and what's wrong, especially in schools. Thank goodness for the great schools, the public system that we have in Nebraska, but it is not that in other places. And so one of the things that I told you about this Trinity Lutheran Church case, one of the things that they were hoping, at least the people that for vouchers was hoping that it would allow parents to receive money to use any which way as far as education. Okay? And so that was not really a result of that, at least as far as they could see. I thought 20 years ago that vouchers would change our education system. But the difficulty with vouchers is that it perhaps takes money away from a good system, a good public school system, and so we have that. But I ask you to pray about that and to think about that. So when we are faced with an opportunity to pledge allegiance, when we are faced with an opportunity to know indeed that this is the time to stand up for what God tells us to do, 
we pray and we know that we will have the strength and the power of God to do that. About the same time that I recalled to you just recently about knowing my parents being interested in, in the politics of the day, uh, I went to Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Emma, Missouri, and we had a flag, and we had a memorial for those that had died in, in World War I and World War II. And every morning that flag would be put up, and every evening that, or afternoon that flag would be taken down. And our janitor was by the name of Mr. Dakey, and uh, I would tag along with him and help him with the flag. And one day, he took the flag down, it must have been in the morning, and uh, he came out, he took the flag down, and he said, I am, this flag is no longer going to be used. It was old. So he put it on the flagpole. And he looked at me, and he said, would you like this flag? Now, as a seven-year-old, I looked at that flag, and I said, yes, you know, this is a treasure. And so I took it home to my mother, and she looked at me, and very kindly said, do you know what responsibilities you have received? And I said, oh. He says, you can't, you need to care for this flag. It's old, but it is still the flag of the United States. You can't burn it. You can't use it for covering. You have to cherish it, treasure it. And so the responsibility of being a citizen of the United States, the responsibility of knowing the difference between God's law and the government's law and be able to split it and be able to work in both but able to protect God's law in that instance slowly came to me and I share it with you. When in doubt we come to God's word and we say we ought to obey God rather than men. And in Jesus' name we say together, Amen.